All right, Mike here again. If you're one of my regular subscribers or my regular channel viewers and you're looking for the content I normally put up, uh, this video is going to be very, very different from uh, my normal content. So you can probably go ahead and disregard that because this video is going to be my video for my uh, Rube Goldberg device for my BC physics class. Uh, it's calc based physics. So if you're interested and want to hang out and watch this, um, my, my Rube Goldberg device in action, you're welcome to stay. Um, if not, perfectly understood. So I'm on attempt six. I have attempted multiple attempts, of course, um, to get this to, to work. Um, so first things first, actually welcome Professor Stone and whoever else is watching. Um, I am actually going to break this video up into two parts. I know that you said that you didn't want us to um, edit our videos, but I have to get some things out of the way before we actually go to the device itself. I have to go over some notes. Um, so this prologue is now going to be the prologue I use for whatever attempt winds up working, and that's the attempt that's going to be included, of course. Um, so that attempt number is just, I'm just going to put that in text uh, in the uh, final video. Um, right now I'm on attempt six. Cross my fingers that it works. Um, it's my last attempt for the day before I have to go to work. Ten minutes to six, not because I've gotten up early, but because I've stayed up really late. Um, so here's how. Here's some the things I need to go over. Uh, first things first. You'll see there are videos around me. Um, those are going to be the various camera angles for the device. Now, as you can see from some of the camera angles, the device takes up the entire living room. So it takes up my entire living room, and on top of that, as you'll see. Uh, the mechanics actually bifurcate uh, throughout the course of the uh, machine. So I'm not sure how I would go about even having a friend go around with a camera to record exactly what's going on with the device. Um, so I, I honestly would probably need two or three people because of the bifurcation and the fact that it takes up the entire room. Uh, so uh, that's why you're seeing all of these camera angles around me. Um, I know that we were not supposed to do any editing. Uh, I'm assuming what that means is that you don't, in the industry jargon, Professor Stone, you don't want us to do any mid-roll cuts because even the OK Go videos that you gave as examples, uh, they of course have a cut at the beginning and a cut at the end. And they, in editing, of course, they sync their audio at the very least. Uh, so that's what you're going to get is you're going to get various camera angles in as raw a form as I can possibly give, full playthrough, nonstop. If if it works out, what I'm going to do is I'm going to expand certain camera angles when I, uh, there's an angle that is focusing some, on something that I want you guys to see. Um, but I won't ever cover up any of the rest of the camera angles. They'll just shrink or expand. I know that you wanted us to do uh, a highlight of one of the... Uh, mechanisms within the device. Uh, I'm actually going to do that in post. That way I can show slow-mo, I can zoom in, and I can really get into a, into depth and just a, a detail as to describing exactly what's going on. Uh, I also uh, wanted to point out the how this is going to work. So a Rube Goldberg device is a machine that takes an incredibly simple task and makes it preposterously complicated, but still accomplishes the task. So in this case, we're looking to take a selfie. So what I'm going to do is, uh, right now I'm recording in OBS. It's my broadcasting software. So you're seeing my image uh, through OBS. 59.94 uh, of those images per second. So technically I'm taking roughly 60 selfies a second because it's a progressive scan. But obviously that's not the intent of the project here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to expand this on my laptop here to full screen. And then I'm going to have a, an object print, press, come crashing down to this press print screen, not on this keyboard right here, but on the keyboard on the complete opposite side of the room, because these things are supposed to be as preposterous as possible. Now, of course, in keeping in the spirit of uh, Rube Goldberg devices and their preposterousness, um, each setup at each reset takes me about an hour and a half, depending on where the mistake is and where the failure in the device is. So uh, 
you know, that's that's an element of ridiculousness with the device, and that's I, th I think is actually in keeping in the spirit of, of the device. So, really hoping I don't have to do, go through all that yet again. This is the sixth attempt. Again, you'll see which attempt is the one that actually finally comes to fruition and works. Um, what I'm going to do to make sure that that it's the right event is I'm going to hold up in, my, in fingers uh, the attempt number. So in this case, we're attempt number six, and I'm going to sit back and let the machine do its thing. Print screen, go in to make sure it works. I'm going to go into uh, paint, paste that screenshot, and uh, save the file as a PNG, and that'll be my selfie. I just want to go over and check my notes here before see make sure there's not something else that I need to go over. Yeah, so I'm going to be pretty much stationary, uh, and this the screen that you're not you're not going to see it, but uh, on my laptop it's going to expand to full screen, and uh, print screen takes a uh, screenshot, which is effectively a selfie in that case. Uh, the other thing I want to point out is I have no idea how the audio is going to work because I'm using the internal cameras and the microphone in the cameras, and I'm using the internal. A microphone in my laptop. Normally, I'll use my uh, mic my microphones, headsets, mixer, and interface. But you know, I don't really have time to set all that up. I don't know if I have room to set all that up. So we'll see how it goes. I apologize if it's not that good. If the audio ends up being garbage. Um, also, uh, just to prove, of course, because I should be doing this, that I I am actually doing this live in four separate cameras and not four totally separate takes. I, I will be doing a wave in each camera. So in this case, uh, for example, this is me waving to the laptop. Me waving to camera one, hi. This is me waving to camera two, hi. And hopefully camera three can find me. Camera three, hi. This is all attempt six. Attempt six, everyone. And of course, camera four is a blurry mess, uh, which I should actually point out. Camera four is my uh, uh, phone. Unfortunately, the focus on the camera on my phone has, uh, it, is there's something wrong with it? I don't know what to do about that. Hopefully, can get something, we can get something out of that. We got three other camera angles. Hopefully, if we can't get anything out of it, then we can make up for, for it with that. We'll have to do that and figure that out in post. Uh, what you'll also see, too, is you'll see me in this video, finishing the rig. In keeping with the spirit of the Rube Goldberg device, everything is in incredibly delicate balance right now. Um, and there's actually, there's actually two or three things that are so preposterously delicately hung in the balance that I'm not willing to uh, set them up and wait. Uh, I'm not willing to do them until I'm, I've got the camera rolling, set them up, and then we can get started so that, you know, we don't have to worry about it, it, it failing on me while I'm sitting here waiting because it is that delicately balanced, like I said. So, I think I've gone everything, over everything I need to go over. Uh, yeah. Yep. Uh, I've had to make a whole bunch of last minute corrections, so no idea if this is going to work. We'll see how it goes. Again, I'll put the attempt number that actually works at the bottom of the screen, and I'll do my wave for everybody, just to make sure that, just to ensure that, to prove that I'm not cheating the system with uh, lots of junk cuts and edits. So, without further ado, I guess uh, let's get started finishing this up. And that is what I meant by delicately hanging in the balance.
Okay, still working on attempt six here, folks. All righty then. Shucks. All right. Okay. We are all set up and ready to go. And of course, like any good machine, like any good game, it doesn't come free of charge. So to play this game, to go on this ride, to use this machine, it takes three quarters, which we insert thusly. All right, well, five after six in the morning, Monday, December 2nd, here we go. This is attempt number six. I think we got it to work. So, yeah, unbelievable. folks, it actually took the selfie. And uh, you know what I'm going to do just to prove this is the case? I'm going to go ahead and grab camera three. So this is me grabbing camera three. That's the broadcasting device servant. Uh, sorry, that's the broadcasting software. You can see me. I'm just gonna get kind of weird here. If I go into paint, 
That was attempt number six. And in fact, I should be able to open up a new one. And I can do control D. There it goes. And just to prove that's the case, control Z. Control Y, Control Y, it's the redo. Sorry, we can just do a paste. There, there we go. All right. Okay. So I guess I'll do this from multiple camera angles just because why not? Um, Hope you all enjoyed. I'll be going over that in greater detail shortly. There we go. Hope you all enjoyed. I'll be going over that in greater detail shortly. See you soon. Okay, so obviously this attempt, the sixth attempt, is the one that worked, so we can disregard everything I said pre-roll about that. Before we get started with analysis, let's see that take again, because it may have been a bit confusing. I'm going to show the whole thing again from a single camera angle, with the other camera angles remaining reduced in size, then I'm going to show it with hard cuts in full screen. So here's the rig in action from a single camera angle. Here we go. This is attempt number six. <laughs> We got it to work. Here it is again at a different single camera angle. Here we go. This is attempt number six. I think we got it to work. And here's the rig in action in full screen with hard cuts. Here we go. This is attempt number six. I think we got it to work. Again, this may still be a bit confusing, so let's walk through this process step by step. I wanted this rig to act conceptually as a world's most ridiculously complicated photo booth where, in the end, all the rig does is press a button, in this case print screen, and not even on my laptop, but on a keyboard on the other side of the room. In keeping with the photo booth theme, the rig starts with the insertion of three quarters. Once the stop is removed, the three quarters travel down a grooved pathway, accelerating towards a block precariously situated on two layers of shims that would both direct it towards the next step and move the center of gravity closer to the board's leading edge, which reduces the momentum, and thus the number of quarters, necessary to knock it over. The board has a pin nailed to the top of it. The pin when the board is knocked over, pops the orange balloon. The cooler, perched atop a mixing bowl attached to the balloon, is weighted with roughly a gallon of water. As such, with nothing to support the cooler, it drops, in this case, to the floor, because the mixing bowl which contains the balloon is on heavily lubricated shims, which direct the two mixing bowls and the cooler away from the coffee table. The cooler is attached by string to what I'm going to refer to as my water cannon, two stools clamped by their seat in a vertically oriented direction, with a sauna tube perpendicularly attached to the upper legs, and containing four Gatorade bottles, each filled with water. Because the string spans atop the sawhorse, the string acts to tip the water cannon towards the sawhorse and the rest of the rig, and then is stopped from complete tip over by the sawhorse itself. This is where the process bifurcates. We'll start with what's happening in the top half of the water cannon. With both the momentum of the tipping water cannon and the angling of the sauna tube, so gravity, the four water bottles shoot out of the cannon and into the lobster pot. Only two bottles actually land in the target, but that's okay because the rig is designed to still work with only two water bottles, with the idea being that it was impossible to perfectly align the lobster pot, so more bottles means a higher likelihood that at least two would hit the target. The lobster pot is supported by pulleys attached to a weighted 2x4 balance scale, we'll call it. However, when the weight of the lobster pot increases with the added weight of the water bottles, it lifts the scale. 
there are a few things to point out here. One, by using a pulley system, I was able to reduce by half the weight necessary to overcome the balance scale through the creation of mechanical advantage. I was also able to extend the lifting point beyond the length of the armature, thereby increasing its leverage. Two, the scale is not hung delicately in the balance. This is why it takes two bottles of water, the weight of the pot, maximized leverage, and a 2x pulley system to lift the armature. Three, to help with the leverage issue, I also added a staple gun and a bottle of water to the other end of the balance scale. Four, the pivot is not at the center of the supporting 2x4s, which is where the center of gravity is, but actually at the outer edge of the 2x4, which is what creates this leverage issue. Five, countering all of this is this water bottle, which is actually acting against the lifting motion of the lobster pot by being attached to the opposite end of the armature by fishing line. In the end, the rig works and lifts the armature. This has the effect of closing the scissors attached to the balance scale, which severs the fishing line attached to the water bottle. The bottle drops, and since it's attached by string using the ramp as a pulley to the final set of scissors, those scissors close, cutting a piece of string which supports a soccer ball, which then falls on a funnel, pressing the print screen button. What's missed, however, is that the string holding up the soccer ball isn't there before the rig is activated. When the quarters are first inserted, the scissors attached to the ladder have a fairly thick insulated copper wire between their cutting arms. The scissors, needless to say, won't cut that wire, especially when it's folded over into two sections, which then far exceed the cutting capacity of the scissors. So what happened? For that, we need to go back to the water cannon. Remember, this is where the process bifurcated. At the bottom of the water cannon, the lowest cross member is attached to the lowering arm of a jack stand. The stand, in conjunction with another one adjacent to it, supports a 45-pound pry bar. When the lowering arm of the jack stand is lifted by the tipping of the water cannon, the stand primary support leg drops, dropping the pry bar to the floor. A few things to point out about this part as well. One, you'll notice the pry bar is attached to bungee cords held taut by a cinder block. This is because the pry bar has a tendency to fall towards the water cannon, which has the effect of both negating the tipping of the water cannon and preventing the pry bar from falling to the floor, which is necessary to activate the next phase. Two, the pry bar also has a string attached to its end. It is attached to the end to maximize the falling force applied to the string, which is further increased by the elastic tension in the bungee cords. That string takes us to the next step. A pulley redirects the string to a paint striper, which is then pulled towards the rig by the string, and in doing so, hits the end of a mic stand, which then spins on its axis, forcing the other end of the mic stand's main arm to knock over this precariously situated water bottle, filled, of course, with water. The water bottle is attached by string to the painter's tray of the folding ladder, forcing the tray to tilt forward to the closed position. The tray is also attached to the string which supports the soccer ball. Using the holes in the top of the folding ladder, typically used for tools such as wrenches, hammers, and screwdrivers, as a pulley, the effect of raising the painter's tray is to lower the soccer ball, thereby lowering the wires out of the cutting arms of the scissors and, therefore, placing the more easily cut mason line, similar to kitchen string, inside the cutting arms of the scissors, which, as we remember from the rest of the rig, then cut the string. This, of course, requires high-precision timing, because if the string is not lowered in time, the scissors will instead close around the wires and won't drop the soccer ball. In the end, the soccer ball drops, lands on the funnel, kept temporarily upright by some weighted red solo cups, depressing the print screen key, and finally, taking the selfie. As this project is supposed to be a presentation highlighting Newtonian mechanics, I wanted my apparatus to contain all six simple machines. You may have noticed that I was able to get five, the wheel and axle of the paint striper, the leveraging of the jack stand lowering arm by the water cannon, the use of every pulley I own throughout the apparatus, the cutting action of the scissors representing wedges, and the inclined plane below the board and pin. Though the rotation of the mic stand is technically a screw, however, the action is really a rotation around an axis, not a lifting action by a screw. Not a complete success, but I'd say five out of six ain't bad, all things considered. On that note, here is where I'm going to complete the assignment and highlight the illustration of 1. An example of conservation of momentum, also known as inertia, in action. 2. An example of conservation of energy in action. And 3. An example of Newton's second law, 
which is that force is dependent upon the combination of an object's mass and its acceleration, as exemplified by the equation F equals ma. An object's momentum can be calculated by the equation P equals mv, where P is the object's momentum, and m and v are its mass and velocity, respectively. This is best exemplified in my apparatus by the very first step. In order for the whole process to begin, the block and pin need to tip over, which is not accomplished with a single quarter because its mass is not enough to create enough momentum to cause the block to tip far enough for its center of gravity to extend beyond the edge of its base. In this case, additionally, we don't care much about acceleration because the quarters jump off the ramp and cannot, therefore, accelerate in a horizontal direction, the direction needed to tip the block. Further, the mass of the block is such that the momentum of the quarters is divided throughout the block, meaning its top speed is going to be significantly less than that of the quarters. It was further determined by experimentation that velocity would have to be maximized under the conditions to get enough momentum to tip the block. In this case, increasing the angle of the ramp means the vertical element of the force of gravity is increased, which, in turn, allows the quarter to more easily overcome the resistive forces of friction, and, as the force of gravity acts as an accelerant, starting the quarters as high as possible on the plane, and thus increasing potential energy, will expose the quarters to as much gravitational force as possible before falling off the ramp, thereby maximizing their velocity. Testing with rubber balls and then converting their momentum relative to their mass with the postage scale allowed me to determine how many quarters it would take and, therefore, how many grooves I would have to cut. The math suggested only two, but only just barely, so, to be sure, I cut three grooves instead. Conservation of energy is exemplified throughout the rig, especially by the conversion of potential to kinetic energy, and, again, the most obvious example is probably the very first, with the positioning of the quarters as high up the ramp as possible being a reflection of the conversion of potential to kinetic energy as potential energy increases with height. But we've already used that example, and there are so many steps in this rig it would just be lazy to recycle the very first step. That said, almost immediately after that first step, the conversion of potential to kinetic energy happens again, this time in the third step with the bursting of the balloon. The weighty mass of the water-filled cooler precariously supported in the end by the balloon creates a condition of high potential energy, as its equation is defined by PE equals mgh, with g being the acceleration due to gravity and h being the maximum height above a certain terminus. When the balloon bursts, the cooler no longer has anything supporting it, and it begins to fall, thereby converting some of its potential energy into kinetic energy. Remember, conservation of energy tells us that energy cannot be created or destroyed, it can only be converted, which is exactly what is happening here. What's interesting is that the cooler will only fall so far, as the coffee table acts as the height delimiter in this equation. Early failed attempts proved that the height was not enough to create enough PE to KE conversion, and, of course, limited the potential energy, to cause the water cannon to tip, as, at the other end, the lowering arm and the mass resisting its lifting required an enormous amount of energy to overcome its rest energy, mostly as a result of the great mass of the pry bar above it. My solution was to add an inclined plane in the form of shims, cover them in a layer of packaging tape, and then lubricating the packaging tape, reducing the frictional force of the wooden shims, forcing both mixing bowls and, therefore, the cooler to drop off the edge of the coffee table. By increasing my height, because the distance from the bottom of the cooler to the floor is greater than the distance from the bottom of the cooler to the top of the coffee table, I was able to increase my potential energy and, by allowing the cooler to thus free fall for longer, allow for greater conversion of this potential energy to kinetic kind, and allowing the whole ridiculous process to continue. Perhaps the most interesting application of the equation F equals ma, force equals mass times acceleration, is the balance scale armature, but that process and its application is extremely complex, so for the sake of concision we'll pick something a bit easier to explain. The dropping of the soccer ball on the button, allowing its mass and acceleration to create a force great enough to overcome the spring force of the button, is probably the most easily explained and obvious example of the equation. But I could end this video right here because of how pedantically obvious that example is, so instead, I'm going to illustrate the most useful example of this law in effect, the dropping of the pry bar by the jack stand.
In this case, the jack stand is largely irrelevant outside of its positioning. The closer to the center of gravity, the better, as the positioning of the other jack stand will prevent the other end of the pry bar from falling, meaning less of the mass of the pry bar will be effectively, resisting the falling action, thereby maximizing exposure to gravitational effects. So we'll remove this element from the discussion. What's really important is how fast we can get the paint striper to move so its momentum can be maximized as it hits the mic stand, which in turn has to knock over the water bottle. If the paint striper is not moving fast enough, it won't hit the mic stand with enough momentum to knock over the water bottle, and the whole thing comes to an end right there. Additionally, there's a small amount of static force, friction, to overcome with the paint striper. This means if the pry bar does not have the acceleration and or mass to overcome the static force, the striper won't even move at all. Because the pulley acts to change the direction of the application of force to a mostly horizontal one without creating any mechanical advantage, the force application on the striper is almost entirely horizontal. This means the velocity, and therefore momentum, of the striper is determined entirely by the horizontal force, in this case tension, of the string. Remember. The falling of the pry bar only to the height of the jack stand's lowering arm was not enough force to, in the end, knock over the water bottle. This is why the very heavy pry bar was used. I needed a lot of both mass and acceleration to achieve the force I needed to set the final steps of this leg in motion. The elastic forces, spring force, of the bungee cords added to this effect. Finally, you'll notice there's a pillow underneath the pry bar. This is because the force the pry bar creates is enormous, and it is all concentrated in the tiny area of its tip. The concentration of a force over an area is its pressure, and, in this case, the pressure applied to the wood floor was so much I was concerned with denting the floorboards. Hence the pillow, though I'm probably not going to be getting my deposit back anyways, which is an entirely separate conversation for another day. That should just about wrap it up. I hope this satisfies the requirements of the project, and thanks to everyone who stuck through this. This was an enormous effort, and regardless of my letter grade, crossing my fingers for an A, it'll be nice to have my living room back. This has been Mike Sinello, signing off.